What makes the dream life? Is it money? Comfort? Family? Power? Experiences? Adventure? Attention? Health? A good cup of coffee? Thrill? Or is it something more? Good morning, Shoreline Church, and welcome to the dream life. The dream life, yeah. It's going to be an incredible journey. Six weeks as we walk through the idea and this concept of the dream life, living the dream life. And so um, what I want to ask you this morning as you think about what is your vision of the dream life? Like, what is your vision of the dream life when you hear the words dream life? And so what we did, we got together with our creative team, and we asked our creative team to pull together some images that capture the dream life. And so I'm going to give you permission this morning, Shoreline Church, whether you're here on campus or whether you're watching online, when, you're, when, a, when an image comes up and you're like, that's the dream life, I'm going to give you permission to clap and cheer and get as loud as you want. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm giving you permission. All right, you ready? All right, here you go. So how about this image? Hiking and exploring the outdoors in search of the perfect waterfall. Is that your idea of the dream life? I might have known we've got some great outdoors folks here. How about this one? How about soaking in the beauty of a garden, enjoying a spot of tea with your family and friends? All right, that's good, there we go. All right, I'm not biased or anything, but this next one's my favorite. Um, how about owning and operating your own farm with lush valleys and beautiful hillsides and vegetables and fruit, and you get to harvest. How about this one? How about just kicking back with your feet up and you're on the shores and the sands of a beautiful tropical beach somewhere? Oh my goodness. Oh, okay, now for all you, those who are not outdoorsmen, we've got one for you. How about this one, sitting courtside at a pro basketball game, either as a coach, a player, or a fan? I, see, I, I thought that was gonna happen. Now, if it had been a Warriors game, you all would have been all over it. Yeah. And how about this one, catching waves from sunup to sundown and walking along the California coastline, Just enjoying that, yeah. So it's wonderful, and all these are wonderful, and you might even have your own vision of a dream life, but the question is, as we have to ask is, is our dream life God's dream life for us? Because so often our desires for a dream life are not in alignment with God's desires for our life. And so we believe the dream life is that life that God designed and that God desires for us, for you and for me. And that's the dream life. And it begins with a free offer, the dream life. And that is that God freely offers us the only true dream life, life with Jesus. And one of my favorite verses in all scripture is John 10, 10. And this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, Jesus is saying that the enemy of our souls, the thief, he comes to only steal and kill and destroy. Notice it's and, and, all three. The enemy of our soul, his desire is to steal and kill and destroy your life, your dreams, your hope, your joy. But Jesus says, oh, but I have come that they may have life and live it to the full. That's the dream life that Jesus promises because see, Jesus is life. Jesus himself, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus lived the perfect life and offered himself, the, he offered the sacrificial death so that we could inherit eternal life and that we could live the abundant and full life. And I wanna make sure that we all understand this. What Jesus is not saying is that the full life is the easy life. 
And I was reminded of the truth of that this week. See, on Monday, my wife and I, we got a call from our son and daughter-in-law. Our, one of our granddaughters had a serious health emergency. And the ambulance had to come to the house and they had to take her to the, to the hospital. And she was treated and she's well, she's fine now. But we had hoped that what had caused this medical emergency, that that was all taken care of. And what we found out on Monday was not. And so now she's going to have some long-term health challenges that will affect her the rest of her life. And then on Wednesday, while I was in a group of pastors, our pastors here at Shoreline, my brothers, my pastors here at Shoreline Church, I received a, a text from my dad and it said my mom had passed away. And in that moment, I was surrounded by my brothers in Christ. They came around me, they prayed for me, they laid hands on me. They encouraged me. And we prayed together. And so today I come to you as a broken, humble, and grieving son who's lost his mother. But I also come as a rejoicing brother in Christ because my mom, as a young girl, gave her life to Jesus Christ. And I know we will meet again on the other side of glory. And if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, someday you will meet Lois Amy Straub, my mom. Amen? And so we know that the dream life is not the easy life. We know that the dream life starts with relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus then also promises us the Holy Spirit. So when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit then dwells in us, takes up residence. And the Holy Spirit is our counselor, our advocate, and he guides us as we take steps to live into the dream life. And we also have the truth of God's word, God's eternal word. God has equipped us with his word to help guide us as we walk, as we live into the dream life. And so what we're going to do over this next six weeks, we're going to take a journey into the book of Ephesians. And when you look at the book of Ephesians, and if you might, may not remember, but the Apostle Paul is the, the author of the book of Ephesians. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul, he had founded the church at Ephesus, and some years later, now Paul is imprisoned in Rome, and Paul writes the letter of Ephesians addressed to those churchgoers, those brothers and sisters of his at Ephesus. And so the people that Paul is writing to, these are real people he really knows, he really loves, and he's encouraging them to continue to walk in the faith that they have been given and they have received. And so I want to pick up our reading in it's Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 20. We'll pick up right there. And right at the top, of your, if you've got your Bibles or you've got your Bible apps, if you look there, you can see there's a portion that says, Instructions for Christian Living. Sounds like the guide to a dream life, right? So here we go. Paul says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. I want to just pause right there. Now, who's Paul talking about when he talks about Gentiles? So in the Old Testament, you have the Jewish people who were the people of God, the chosen people by God, and then you have everybody else, and that reference would be to the Gentiles. But in the New Testament, where Paul references here, that the term, the Greek word is ethnos, and what that means is anyone who has not yet placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Those people who have willfully not yet chosen to receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And so that's who Paul's talking about when he uses the term Gentiles. In verse 18, we'll pick it back up. It says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity and having given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity and they are full of greed, full of greed. And so a just quick summary of what Paul's saying here is that life apart from Jesus Christ, those folks who are walking that path, it's a life that's filled with spiritual blindness. It's like walking in the pitch black of darkness all around and aimlessly walking and wandering. It's a life that's marked by a hardened heart 
And the word here in the Greek that implies the heart hardening, it's like a callus. So those of you who lift weights, or if you work out and you work with a shovel or a rake, you know, eventually those blisters that you get early on, they turn to a callus. And those calluses have little to no feeling, nerve endings. There's no nerve endings. So it's, it's literally a heart that's calloused and covered and not able to understand and embrace the truths of God. A hardened heart. And also this idea that when you read, you see this, it's a life that's filled with self-centeredness. Every kind of greed, Paul says. Self-indulgence, sensuality, self before everything else. It's this idea that the person in this condition is pursuing what's best for me, myself, and I. And so Paul's talking here about those who freely choose to reject God's grace in Jesus Christ. And who else is he talking about, church? He's talking about people like me on September 5th, 1990. You see, this is a beautiful portrayal and depiction of my life on September 5th. See, I was pursuing what I thought was the dream life. But what had happened was everything I did was about pleasing myself and not providing for my wife and our three children. And on September 5th, it was my birthday, and I came home to an empty house. Because my wife had had enough of me pursuing my self-centered and selfish desires. And my wife had gone away, and she went to her sister's house, which was about an hour away, And while she was at her sister's house, her sister encouraged her, her brother-in-law encouraged her, go talk to our pastor. And so she met with the pastor. And the pastor told her, and asked her, he said, now Amy, is your husband a Christian? And my wife said, yeah, he grew up, you know, his mom knows Jesus, and he grew up in a home where there's Bible. And he says, no, no, is he a Christian? And she said, no. And he said, honey, before you do anything else, you go back and you share the gospel with your husband. Now, I'm going to correct the record from an earlier service. I thought it was one day later when she came back. And I shared that earlier this morning with the congregation. After the service, my wife reminded me, she said, honey, I didn't come back for three days. Three days. Now, there's a spiritual meaning here, right? There's a spiritual meaning, but she didn't come back for three days. And the story doesn't end there. She came back three days later. I'll pick up that story in a moment. So I want to jump into Ephesians 4, verse 20 to 24. Paul writes these words. He says, that, however, he's referring back to what we just talked about is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness." Now, Paul's not saying that we're going to be God. He's saying like God, which means we're going to grow to be more like Jesus Christ, God himself. And so who's Paul talking about here, church? He's talking about believers, those who have willingly and freely received the gift of grace in Jesus Christ and have placed their faith in Jesus. And so Paul, it's really interesting as you go through this this, uh, this portion of Ephesians, really chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul uses sort of this kind of out with this and in with this. Paul's like, well, you need to stop doing this and start doing this. And so what we're going to see over the next six weeks is this idea of getting rid of some of these things and all of those things that cause us to live the wrong life, the life that God doesn't desire for us, and to put on or to take on new things over here, and we're going to talk about that. But here's the first of those. Paul's talking about put off in verse 22. And what does he mean by put off? The word there, the Greek word is apatithemai, apatithemai, which means to lay aside, to set aside, to cast off, to get rid of would probably be the best translation for today's modern English. 
And so I tried to uh, think about the context of what Paul's saying here. Paul's not just saying it's to get rid of, there's also a sense of urgency and a sense of permanence to what Paul's saying. It's not like, yeah, just, you know, put it over there and maybe, you know, maybe go back to it and drift back to it. So Paul's saying, no, no, you need to get rid of it and it needs to happen now and you need to leave it there. That's Paul's, that's the context. So I tried to think of what would illustrate that for you, Shoreline Church, whether you're here on campus or at home. I thought about this. If someone walked up to you and said, close your eyes, and so you close your eyes, and then they put something in your hands, and you begin to feel that thing writhing around, wriggling in your hands, and then you hear this sound. And you realize it's a rattlesnake that just handed you. What are you going to do with the rattlesnake, church? You're casting it off, I would hope. You don't want to get bit. That's the sense of urgency that Paul's talking about. And once I've gotten rid of it, I'm probably not going to go pick up that rattlesnake. That's the permanence. Paul says, cast it off and leave it behind. And Paul says, though, the other side, verses 23 and 24, in with the new. In with the new. He says, put on the new self. To be made new in the attitude of your mind and put on the new self. See, Paul's talking about a new way of life. Leave the old way of life behind and put on the new way of life. He's not talking about earning our salvation, church. We've got to make sure we understand that. Because we know that when we come to the cross, we come to the cross, it is by grace you've been saved. And we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing we do, nothing we can say, nothing we've ever done earns us that position at the cross. And so we give our life in Jesus Christ, we give our life to Jesus Christ, we place our faith in him. And in that moment, in that moment we're made right with God because of Christ's righteousness that cover us. And in that moment, this is what Paul's saying, you remember that old way of life, this over there? He says you need to cast that off and get rid of it. And you need to walk into the dream life that God desires and designed for you. That's casting off and putting on, or putting off and putting on. And so when we think about our new life in Jesus Christ, and what Paul's saying here is that our new life in Christ should look distinctively different as we continue to grow to be more Christ-like. It begins with faith in Jesus Christ, and then we have things like new attitude and thinking. Paul gets at that the new attitude of our minds, which means that before we would kind of filter everything through what's best for us, for me, myself, and I, now we filter everything through the lens of Christ. What pleases Christ? Also, we look at these things where we used to pursue those selfish desires that were self-centered. It was all about your, ourselves and pleasing ourselves. Now Paul said, no, what pleases Christ? Continue to pursue that. Paul also talks about a life that before, if you remember, you think about that picture of those who are separated from God. They're kind of wandering in the darkness aimlessly, but they're continuing to walk further and further and further from the life that God wants for them. And Paul says, in Christ, we can take step by step by step, powered by the Holy Spirit, growing to be more like Jesus Christ. Now, what's important, church, is are we going to step perfectly the rest of our lives? Absolutely not. We have to remember, we have a natural tendency to want to drift back and pick up some of those old attitudes, those old behaviors, that old unchrist like character. But when we do, we can turn and we can repent and we know that grace always covers. So grace is always there. Jesus is always calling us to grow to be more like him. And so, for me, when I told you earlier, my wife returned three days later. And you're like, how in the world, Pastor Sean, did you miss that? How could you realize it, it wasn't the next day? For 30 plus years, I thought it was the next day. That goes to show you the darkness, the spiritual bondage that I was in. For three days, I was completely alone, isolated, empty. And my wife in that time prepared to share the gospel and she came back. And there in our little two-bedroom apartment, 
my wife shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for the first time in my life, I knew what was missing in my life was Jesus Christ. My life of emptiness that turned into a nightmare. And Jesus said, follow me. And I followed him ever since then. And I'm so thankful because my wife shared the gospel that day. And my life has been transformed. Now, 30 plus years later, I had the opportunity, the joy, the pleasure, the honor of serving our country in the military for 30 plus years. We have four adult children who are married and have their own children. We have nine grandchildren. My wife and I, Amy, we have our own little baseball team now. We got a league of our own, right? What? And I had the honor now of serving as one of your pastors here at Shoreline Church. And who would have ever thought on September 5th, 1990, how far I was from God, 30 plus years later, that I'm up here sharing God's truth with you all. Out of a broken person that God redeemed and restored. And so when we think about our own lives thing, church, a question for each one of us, is there something in my life that is holding me back from the life that Jesus desires for me? Question for you to ask that. Is there something in your life? I ask the same mind. Is there something in my life that's holding me back? Or maybe I'm holding on to, and I need to let that go so that I can pursue the dream life. So I want to encourage you. Maybe that's an attitude. Maybe that's a behavior. Maybe that's something in the way you handle conflict or situations to let that go and seek the Lord and he'll bring it to light. I'm confident if you will come to him humbly today and for the next six weeks and continue to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps today you're here on campus or you're watching online and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. Our prayer for you here at Shoreline Church and all my brothers and sisters would say this, that our prayer is that you would come to know Jesus Christ. And if it's during this six week time frame that you would know his grace, you would receive his love, you would follow Jesus all the days of your life, then that would be a greatest joy. One of our greatest joys here at Shoreline Church is when we get a chance to watch someone come to Christ. Nothing better than that to watch. So we want to encourage you to continue to be open to how God would lead you. And so as we think about that first portion of Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul says you need to cast off the old and you need to step into the new, Where do you think the Apostle Paul starts with when it comes to changing and modifying the way we behave in our lives? He starts with our words. He starts with our words. If you look at uh, this whole idea in Ephesians 4.25, is about we're going to live the dream life by communicating with integrity. Paul's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about how we communicate. He starts off with communicating with integrity. Verse 25 says this, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. You see, the context here is Paul is addressing the church specifically because it says we're all members of one body. But Paul's saying, hey, we've got to address some serious situations to help you grow to continue to walk into the dream life that God wants and desires for you. And he starts with, our words and the way we communicate. So Paul's idea with out with the old, did you see that in the text? It said, put off falsehood. What does that mean? It means stop lying. It means stop lying. Stop speaking untruths. And so for us today, church, that's still of all the time. We we are in a world that is culture, that culture, it, it feeds off of untruths. And so just as it was for Ephesus 2,000 years ago in the church there, we're called to speak truthfully as well. And that's Paul's in with the new. So out with lying and in with speaking truth. And so why do you think Paul addresses this topic? Right out of the bat, right after he talks about putting off the old. Number one, Jesus is the truth. And as Christ followers, we're called to reflect his character. So church, we're called to speak in truth. Also, that many of you probably know this, but the nightmare effects of someone who's caught in a life of lying, not only on them and their careers, but their families, and everything around them is completely gone 
because they're living a life of lies and speaking untruths. And so how can we put this into practice? How can we live a life that's more reflective of the truth? So how can we put it in practice? We're going to ask two questions. The first thing we're going to ask is before I say it, before I post it, before I tweet it, before I retweet it, and before I text it, I'm going to ask, number one, is it true? Is it true? And we know that truth can uh, be masked many different ways. Untruths come in many different forms. One of those is deception. And that's like deliberately concealing the truth. So someone says, hey, Sean, did you get that text I sent you? And I saw the text, but I just didn't want to respond. How am I going to respond? Right here it says we're supposed to speak truthfully. Maybe it's time to have a hard conversation with that friend. I didn't respond because of whatever. But don't mislead them. Don't, don't deceive them. Second, exaggeration is another one. Inflating the truth. That's one of the ways that we don't speak truthfully. We inflate the truth. So somebody says, hey, how was the fishing today? And of course, I say, oh, it was great. And they say, oh, really? How big was the fish you caught? And I go, it was this big. It was this big. That's exaggeration. And that's also untruth. And then finally, misrepresentation. That's providing a misleading statement to someone. And I have to pause here because, unfortunately, as a military officer, as I rose through the ranks, I saw, and it broke my heart, so many times, young soldiers, men and women, officers, warrant officers, who, when caught in a position where they had been speaking or leading a life of untruth, and we gave them the opportunity to just come clean and just speak truthfully. I was so caught up in that. And I remember distinctly one, a young officer who I'd really grown fond of. I was, I was a company commander in the 101st Airborne Division. And I'd grown very fond of this young officer. This young officer, unfortunately, developed a gambling habit. His wife brought that to our attention. And what had happened, we brought him in and we asked him, we said, hey, how can we help you? How can we get some help for you? And he denied and denied and denied. Well, then finally what happened was months later, we ended up finding out that he had been charging charges on his U.S. government credit card, which was supposed to be used just for missions, official government business. And he had been charging on that at casinos in Las Vegas. And we had all the evidence right there. And we brought him in and we said, look, here's the evidence. Will you just acknowledge and we can help you? And even with all that, he denied it. And he filled out a false statement. Three weeks later, it absolutely broke my heart to watch as the military police from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas showed up. And they pulled up and we brought this officer out there, handcuffed, and off he went to Fort Leavenworth. His whole career, his family, devastated because he just wouldn't speak the truth. And so speaking the truth is imperative if we want to live the dream life that God calls us to. The second thing we need to ask is before we say it or text it or post it or retweet it, we've got to ask, is it trustworthy? Is it trustworthy? Is the information I've received, is it trustworthy? And I was worked many years in the intelligence field, and we used to have kind of an acronym that would help us determine if something was trustworthy or not. We use a CRV, not California recycling value, which you see on your aluminum and your bottles, right? But CRV. The first is, is it credible? Is the information that's presented, is it credible or is it just like true, too true? Is it like, what? That, it sounds too good to be true. And what do we know? If it sounds too good to be true, Shoreline, it's probably not true. So the first thing we have to ask, is it credible? Second, is it reliable? Is it consistently good in quality? Is it able to be trusted? So like if we go to in, in and out Burger, we can pretty much ensure that we're gonna have a good burger at in and out Burger. We don't go to in and out Burger for a fried chicken sandwich. We might go to Chick-fil-A for that. But what we know is when we go to in and out Burger, the reliability factor of that restaurant is really high. And so we can trust that we'll probably have a good experience there. So we have to ask the same for information. Is it reliable? And then finally, is it verifiable? 
Is it verifiable? Is it able to be checked and substantiated to demonstrate it to be true, accurate, and justified? We used to say this in the military, said, in God we trust, all others we, we verify. In God we trust, all others we verify. And so Shoreline Church, I, uh, I want to ask for your help here. I got a text this morning. It came in from Walgreens. And uh, the number is uh, 208-591-1416. So Shoreline, I want to ask you, uh, it says, Walgreens would want to share a chance to thank you for your assistance. What do you think, Shoreline? Should I, should I open it up and see what Walgreens is going to give me for a prize? Why not? It's not verified. It's not believable. It's not credible. And not only that, but if Walgreens is using a personal cell phone, 208-591-1416, it's probably time for me to get a new pharmacy, huh? <laughs> yeah, so it's not trustworthy. So that's the point, folks, is we have to be very cautious in how we handle information. Is it trustworthy? Well, as we continue in Ephesians, Paul also highlights this idea that living the dream life is communicating with consideration. Communicating with consideration. So we're called to speak truthfully, but we're also called to speak graciously. Last week, Pastor Kevin shared that Jesus came in grace and truth. And now we see that balance again here in Ephesians as Paul says, speak truthfully, but also speak graciously. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And so Paul's point here is out with the old, we need to get rid of unwholesome talk. And the word that Paul uses in the Greek is a word called sapros. Sapros. And this is what it means. I'm going to read this. It means corrupted, of poor quality, bad, unfit for use, worthless, rotten, putrid, as in bad fruit, rotting fish, or spoiled milk. And those are the types of words we're not supposed to speak. And so I know many, I'm trying to think about like what would illustrate how bad something like that would be if we think about the, the literal effect that Paul's talking about here, he's using that figuratively because he's talking about harmful and words that would tear down other people. So I thought about many, many years ago, my wife were raising our kids and they're just little ones. And we had car seats back then and we had a minivan. Yes, minivans were cool back then. And, and I would clean out the minivan probably once a month. And every now and then, we lived in Arizona, I would find either tucked by the side of the car seat or under the seat, I would find a baby bottle about half full with either apple juice or baby formula that had been sitting baking <laughs> in the minivan in the Arizona sun. And so guess what? You think I'm going to open that up and drink that? Absolutely not. That bottle has just become history. That's sapros. That's the image that Paul's saying, don't let that unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. And things like that we might think about what would be damaging and disruptive and would be absolutely destroy people's lives. Things like gossip, Paul's getting at here. Unwholesome talk, things like gossip. Gossip, which can be true, but gossip is sharing information about another person without their permission. And the other side of that is slander. One of the ways that we speak unwholesome words is by communicating something that's not true about another person. That's slander. In either case, both are damaging and both are destructive to that person's life, their reputation, but also to your own. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, we got to get rid of that. Cast that off. And Paul says, but only speak what is helpful in building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Paul's talking about intentionally communicating in a Christ-honoring way with other people, considering others when we speak. And so the question then is, should I say it? Should I text it? Should I post it or should I retweet it when it comes to this aspect? Paul's talking. The first thing we have to ask is, is it constructive? That's what Paul's talking about when he says, helpful for building others up. And he's not talking about building up their egos. And he's not talking about compromising the truth. He's saying, hey, whatever we speak, it should be helpful for building others up. And earlier versions of scripture, other translations, use the word edify. Edify. Which is always used in context of helping people grow to be more Christ-like. 
It's those words of encouragement that you speak to someone that helps them grow to be more like Jesus. So it's like words like my father-in-law many years ago after becoming a Christian, I asked him about what is this tithe and offering things? And my father-in-law, Tony, explained to me the purpose of the tithes and the offerings and why, why we, we give those to the work of the Lord, to the church and other ministries and other nonprofit organizations. But specifically, we're tithing and offering so that the, God's work can continue to be done through the church. And so what Tony and I went to him and I said, now, Tony, I said, you know, we're, you know I'm, I'm still in college and we got three kids and we're barely making ends meet. And this is what Tony said to me as a brand new believer. He said, Sean, here's where I'll tell you to start. He said, you need to start now and start with something. Start now and start with something. So I've been on a journey, my wife and I, a journey over the last 30 plus years to continue to grow in joyful generosity, which is one of our spiritual markers of growth. But my father-in-law had the courage to speak those words, it would build me up to help edify, help me grow to be more Christ-like. And so that's what we're called to do as well. And the last question we have to ask is, is it beneficial? Is it a benefit to those who listen? And now Paul's here talking about words that we use. Our words can help to encourage people. They can help to correct people. If someone's headed towards a cliff, I would hope that you would have the courage to help bless them by sharing some words of encouragement to help correct them from doing whatever they're doing. So these are words that are beneficial. And like that image up there on the screen, you see, this is a passing out water at a marathon stop. You've been out running all day long. Your lips are parched. And our words can be like that cup of water to that marathon runner. We have the power to do that. And so Paul's telling us we should do that. And I was thinking about some words that have blessed me in particular. On Father's Day, I got this message from my daughter. And she'd sent a message to all of her brothers. She had three brothers and her, her own husband. And these words were intended to encourage them as fathers. And this is what she said. She said, happy Father's Day to all you guys. To have all you dads active and spiritually leading your families is such a blessing. You are all so intentional, loving, caring, accepting, and present. And I think we can all say super fun. Your kids love you so much. That's my daughter sharing words of blessing that are beneficial to others. And then she went on to say this. And she said, especially happy Father's Day to you, Dad. Truly don't know how to say how much I love you and thank you for all you do. You've always supported me since the day you wore a pink polo to the hospital to meet me. Don't let that get out, Shoreline. <laughs> Thanks for always encouraging us and now loving on your grandkids and showing them an active grandpa in their lives who loves them, who prays for them, and who will always be there even if it means wearing a pink polo shirt. Words of my daughter and bless me so much so that I save that in my form. I share that today. Those words that we use can bless others. They bless me. That same daughter was a one-year-old baby, was quietly asleep in the crib next to her mommy and daddy when I gave my life to Christ on September 8th, 1990. 30 plus years later, she's now blessing her father with those words. And so we think about words and the way we communicate. What is one way that I communicate? What is one way that you communicate that needs to change to allow you to continue to step into the dream life that God would have for you? And as I close, I just want to ask you to think about your life five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and think about the life that God desires and has designed for you. And so will you be open to this day and for the next six, six weeks in particular to hear God's word and to hear God calling you to step into the dream life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for my sisters. And I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice your love for us, and your grace that is extended to us all the days of our life. And so, Jesus, when we think about this concept of out with the old and in with the new, 
Jesus, I pray that for each one of us, there's something that we're holding on to that's holding us back from the life you would desire for us. Jesus, that you would bring that to us, through the power and the work of your Holy Spirit. Transform us to be more like you. And Jesus, we know how powerful our words are. Your word says that words can bring life and death. We pray, Lord, that we would bring words of life that would reflect you. You are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of us that you would help us grow in how we communicate with integrity and communicate in consideration of others. And so, Lord, have your way in us and through us, we pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Sean. You are an incredible pastor. I said this last service, but it is a joy and an honor to, to have you lead me and to be a pastor and staff with you, Sean. Every time he preaches, we are so blessed by his words. Uh, before we take off and go share with the rest of the peninsula about Jesus this week, there's a few things I want to direct your attention to in the streets. The first one is we have a foundations class happening at 1230 today that goes until 2 p.m. up in the garden room, and it's all about growing a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you are new to the faith uh, or if you're just like that person that's sitting here this morning that says, I could just use a little refresher in my faith faith, this is for you, and I'd highly encourage you to go, because this really will be a moment you're going, wow, I just, I needed this. This is a dynamic way that I can grow in my faith. So head up to the garden room. We'd love to see you there. Uh, and if you need prayer this morning, I just want you to know this. Pastor Dennis and his team always have people up here that love to pray for you. So if you were really moved or touched by Pastor Sean's sermon today, and you're going, I just need prayer, I want to highly encourage you, if you're here on, in the worship center, to come up and get prayer. If you're out in the courtyard, there will be somebody right to the right of the Jumbotron, and they are willing to pray with you as well. And if you're joining us online, you can actually call in to the number on the screen, and we have a team waiting that will love to pray for you as well. And if this is your first time at Shoreline, or if you're relatively new to Shoreline, first off, I just want to say welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and if you're joining us online, you can actually text the word welcome, and you're going to get a digital connect card, and we'll have somebody connect with you as well. But if you're with us on campus, I, I really want to encourage you to head out to the Connection Center, because we have a very friendly team that would love to meet you, and would love to give you, give you a gift and just say thank you for being with us. If you're able to stand, I just want to give you a blessing as you guys head out this morning. The dream life, it is amazing. The dream life is all about going all in with Jesus and having our lives changed. And as you go from this place, I want to encourage you, let the words that come out of your mouth build others up. Let them encourage people. Let them equip people. and Let people's lives be changed because of the words that are going to come from you. We will see you next week as Pastor Kevin kicks off week two of The Dream Life. Have a great week.